Welcome to r slash malicious compliance, where we share stories of people conforming to the letter but not the spirit of a request. Thank you friends for subscribing to the channel and for so many likes. The first story, company paid me a salary for just walking around the office. The second story, dad slash boss insists that I turn on propane torch full blast so he can light it while it is aimed at his feet. And I do. The third story, my parents made the insurance company pay them. The first story, the one where I was paid almost three months just for walking. Context, I was working short-term contracts via an agency at the time to experience different fields and the cash while I looked for something more permanent. First contact, I got this one contract at a health center I show up on my first day and have a hard time getting a hold of my new boss, so I just wait around awkwardly, asking around for her. When I finally meet her, she's a stressed person, constantly walking and talking fast and barely listening. I ask what work I'm supposed to do, but she says she has no time for me, so she gives me a stack of papers and asks me to make as many copies as possible. The social worker uses them all the time, and we can literally never have too many. I don't even have the time to wonder if I have any questions that she's done. The copies are bad, some are faded, others are poorly cropped. I track down the originals or the earliest copies possible to improve the quality of the booklets as much as possible and make an SH load of copies. It is mind-numbing work and I am bored out of my mind. After over 60 hours of copying the same SH, I was brain dead inside and quite frankly miserable. They stacked up at first. But it turns out it was because the social workers didn't know they could use them. They didn't want to steal someone else's stuff. So when I explained I was filling my time with that while my real job was explained to me and that these copies were free for all, they were ecstatic and grateful. The good news spread and rose like bubbles in a freshly poured beer, and the mood was awesome. It made my mental misery and countless paper cuts worthwhile. The actual job. That ended when my boss finally took the time to explain the project she had actually hired me for. The health center wanted to maximize the use of the meeting rooms and needed me to watch how they were being used. She wanted to know when people got in and out of the rooms and what they were using them for. This was to track the downtimes and maybe even rent out some meeting rooms to outsiders. I asked how exactly I was supposed to do that since I couldn't be in three different floors at the same time and watch them from end to another among multiple corridors. She said she didn't know and to figure it out, and she ignored me and walked out on me. I was dumbfounded, but I complied. I honestly still have no idea how I was supposed to accomplish that. The best solution I found was to walk all the corridors in a loop. One loop took roughly 8 to 13 minutes, 13 when I started, 8 as I built cardio and muscles. I took a few minutes break so each loop started every 20 minutes. That way I'd have an idea of the room usage. I intended to eventually compile the information on the computer, Likely my personal one since I had no equipment assigned to me. The Compliance So for months I walked. I was used to desk jobs. My feet at first were swollen and everything hurt. I was tired, dead tired when I finished work. But that was actually the upside. I had never had such nice legs and booty. I became fitter and my pants looked really good on me. The downside was that it created a hostile work environment. The health workers using the rooms felt hawked and watched. To them I was basically a spy for management. I had their names and activities with time logs and room numbers. You couldn't tell easily if a room was in usage, so I literally had to bend over to see if there were feet inside via the non-glazed portions of the glass panes, when there were any. I couldn't always tell who had used what room. It was hell. Everyone hated me. I became depressed. There was no one I could talk to. My boss basically ignored and avoided me, and she was my only point of contact. I tried to be friendly and nice, but I was still pretty much just hated. I made the mistake of reading an article on the Palestine and Israel conflict, something I knew little about at the time. Since I couldn't finish the article in one go, I left the newspaper open on that page while I hurried through my round, and when I came back a doctor was upset and crying, saying something about how it was on purpose, since the newspaper was open on that page. I had no idea why it was wrong to read a newspaper article, and I was already hated so I just walked away bewildered. The following day my only comfort at work disappeared. It was a tiny teaspoon beautifully decorated that had accompanied me throughout my university years. It was a source of comfort to me like a teddy bear or warm blanket in that cold place where I didn't belong and wasn't welcomed. I was so upset. I literally made one at lost posters and still, no one ever gave it back. 
I had stupidly ran out of time after drinking my coffee and left it in my mug while I hurriedly made a round. In the few minutes I was gone, it disappeared. Honestly, I missed being chained to the photocopy machine at that point. At least people actually appreciated what I did back then, and I was liked, not hated. The fallout. Mercifully, I found a permanent job downtown with very good conditions, so I gave my notice, at which point my boss finally made time for me. I could almost swear she had been avoiding me until then, and any interaction was cut short by her mumbling something or other, without paying attention to what I was saying and fast walking away. So anyway, at this point she asked me to see what I'd done. I explained my reasoning and showed her my piles of data, accumulated for almost three months by then. She was shocked. This is useless, she said. I wanted to smirk. I wanted to roll my eyes. Honestly, what did she expect? She wasn't wrong though. It was useless data. Columns and columns of data coded in simple letters and scribbled notes. Completely unreliable since even as I was taking the notes, I had no way of confirming if anyone was really in the room or not. Well, this is the best I could do with the resources and guidance I was given, I said, and shrugged. Not my problem. Honestly, I just wanted out. She was shocked and angry and I didn't give an SH. I had been paid to walk 8 hours a day. My very presence made everyone hate management. I was never so happy to leave a job. Things were looking up. I never looked back. I still hate that place. A social worker there stole my custom ordered books from Japan. She never answered my calls when I tried to reach her about it. She had an address where she could drop them and multiple phone numbers she could use to reach me. All that info I had also taped inside the books. She just ignored me and kept them, even though she said she didn't like them. WTF. I was young, dumb, and naive. I believed her to be trustworthy because of her job and the impression she gave off. Much regrets were had. My Nausicaa of the Valley of the Wind collection remains pilfered to this day. F that place. Lesson learned for sure. To be fair though, it was my mental health crutch. The place was soul crushing and sent me in the deepest depression of my life until then. Those personal items were what I hung on to. After they were stolen, I never smiled again at work and looked like a ghost. But hey, got fit, got paid and effed over the management. I'd have left with my middle fingers held up if I didn't have a bunch of bags and bus pass to carry. The next story is… Shut up and turn on the gas? Okay. This is a really old event, and for the record, I'm a decent enough human being to feel really bad about how this came out. After I was done feeling vindicated and amused, I felt extra bad because of those feelings, so I guess it somewhat balances. Back in the late 80s through the mid-90s, my dad grew watermelons every year. It's a good cash crop, but intensive on the physical labor side of things, and you're working hardest when the weather is hottest. You have to work really hard to pick the melons when they're ready, to pick as healthy vines will bump out, growth on the remaining melons fast in late June, so you can pick again in just a few days. So only a certain type of person is willing and able to really capitalize on the crop. My dad was just that certain type of person. He was transitioning all of his farming activity from row crops like corn and peanuts and cotton to pecans. He needed that summer cash crop of watermelons to stay afloat until the pecans were paying off. I worked for him at the time, and part of the successful transition from row crops to pecans hinged upon using buried drip irrigation for the pecans. For six years, I buried drip irrigation for several months every year. We were able to water groves with $2,000 wells instead of the $200,000 wells needed with sprinklers. Big difference. Anyway, we irrigated the melons with drip irrigation too. Only it wasn't durable stuff used on the melons. It was thin, cheap stuff made to last a season and no more. The plastic film covering the beds was one milliliter thick and would photo degrade from sunlight in a year. The drip tape itself did need to be picked up and disposed. So this one year my dad gets a bright idea to burn the film at the end of the season instead of letting it break down slowly. A local AG company has a towable burn rig you can rent. Now this thing is just the sort of rig no one in their right kind would insure. I'll describe it because it was a real monster. Okay, start with a thousand gallon propane tank. The huge kind you see in some yards that only have to be filled every couple of years. Now you put that mamba jamba on top of a homemade trailer made to be pulled behind a farm tractor. And you hook up a pump to the PTO on the tractor so that it can pump the propane, not just let it flow from expansive properties. Cause you need a lot of propane to flow for this kind of beast. Then the back of the homemade trailer has a support shaft mounted across it. And there are two long boom shafts on hinges that fold forward for transport, but can be locked perpendicular like wings when deployed. They are 16 feet long each. The trailer is 8 feet across, so when the wings are deployed this bad boy spans 40 feet. Every 4 feet on all 3 shafts there's a torch. These torches are angled down and backwards. The idea is that a flaming jet of propane would hit every scrap of plastic film and burn it away. 
We won't even get into the environmental aspects. So this was August. All the melons were done, and cleanup needed to happen. My dad rented this beast, had me hook it up to a tractor, and meet him in one of the fields. There were two controls up in the cab with the operator, both toggle switches. One of them was to turn on the gas for pilot lights on the torches. The other was to go full-on burn everything in sight. But it was a windy day, maybe 10 to 15 miles per hour average. I was not comfortable. I voiced my objections to burning on a windy day and got shut down hard. Told to just F.O. as I was told. Okay then. So I'm sitting up there in the cab following instructions. I get told to turn on the gas for the pilot light so I do. And then I sit there for a good 5 to 10 minutes twiddling my thumbs because it's too de windy to be burning stuff. It's too windy to get the torches to light. The breeze is so stiff it's dissipating the gas and blowing out the old man's lighter repeatedly and I'm just sitting there doing as instructed. After another 50 or 60 failed attempts, my dad slash old man slash boss was reaching at the end of his patience and yelled up at me to not just sit there. Turn on the full gas. Now, I was annoyed and didn't want to be out there, but this just seemed to be a bad idea, so I spoke up. Me, but that will, him, shut up, do what I said. Me, but, him, shut up, either flip that switch or get down here and light it while I flip it. We need more gas to get it to light. Me flips the switch, torch ignites, shoots a jet of flame directly onto the old man's sandaled feet. Yes, that's right, he was wearing sandals, and he lit a wide open jet of propane that was aimed directly at those sandaled feet. I let out a loud bray of laughter just as I flipped the switch to off. The old man's head swiveled away from his feet to me in a trice, but despite my guffaw, I had a sober, morose expression plastered on. He couldn't wear shoes for a couple of weeks. While he didn't need dressings on his feet, they were pretty well done. We didn't burn any watermelon film that year. The last story is... But we didn't mean for life. Not my story, but my parents. Car involved. 2005 Diesel Jetta. The generation before the recalled model. About 10 years ago, my dad got into a bad accident in the Jetta. Woman T-bones him at full speed. Left side of the car shot to hell. He starts the claim through his insurance and they start the repairs. The insurance adjuster writes into the repair report that the insurance company put a lifetime guarantee on all repairs done to the car from this accident. Things that were repaired and replaced included the transmission, the condenser, the radiator, serpentine belt, headlights assembly, ECU, etc. Basically a lot of big ticket items. So time wears on, and about three years later the clutch pad needs to be replaced. So my dad takes it into the shop and then sends the insurance company through bill. Insurance agent, why are you sending this to us? Dad, it's one of the things repaired after the accident that you guaranteed for life. Insurance company, we didn't mean lifetime, we meant a year. Dad, well the policy says lifetime so you're on the hook. After a few nasty grams between lawyers, the insurance company pays up. But now my parents are peeved at the way they've been treated, so they resolve to keep the car until the floorboards rust out. Things that have been replaced on the insurance company dime since then, clutch, radio, left front tire multiple times, brake pads and rotors, front bumper, driver door window motor, air filter, left side engine mounts, etc. The insurance company tried to buy them out a few years ago, but my parents refused, and since no limitations were put on the repair policy, the insurance company's on the hook for as long as my parents own the car. It's a manual diesel, so it's going to live forever. I hope you love these stories. Don't forget to subscribe if you want to know when the new videos come out.